exercise how important um, the autonomous bonus points are. So as you can see in Teleob, uh, you have to go into the warehouse, pick up the freight, go out of the warehouse, and then place it on the, uh, the top level of the shipping hub just to get six points. Well, in autonomous, if you place the preloaded box uh, on a randomized level, uh, then you can get 20 points. So uh, it's like super important. Um, and you have to go like four times during teleop just to get the same amount of points as once during autonomous. Okay, so the ideal situation, this is like if you have infinite time, your robot uh, can do everything. Um, for autonomous, you put the shipping element on the barcode so you get a 20 point bonus instead of a 10 point bonus. And you pick up the shipping element uh, so you don't knock it, uh, don't accidentally knock it down uh, during teleop or endgame. And then you put the preloaded freight into the correct level of the shipping hub. You spin the carousel once. You're only allowed to spin it once during um, autonomous. And then you park fully in the storage. Uh, this, using this, you can gain the maximum amount of points in autonomous. And then for teleop, uh, you put the ball freight in the Alliance shipping hub because the ball freight is light and it doesn't really tip over uh, your shipping hub. So the shipping hub doesn't, uh, doesn't you don't have to like calculate how many blocks you have to put onto it to make it balanced. And then the heavy blocks are recommended to be put in the shared shipping hub. Um, Reason for this is because one of the heavy blocks is equal to six light blocks. So you put a heavy block on the shared shipping hub, it's um, really easy to just tip the shipping hub over and make your life easier during end game. And then the other light blocks, you can put them in the aligned shipping hub because they don't really affect the balance. And then for end game, oops. For end game, um, uh, since uh, since uh, you already picked up the shipping element from Autonomous, you can easily cap the Alliance Hub, drop all of the remaining ducks from the carousel to get maximum 48 points, and then uh, you can claim the shared hub, uh, which will be really easy because hopefully you put the heavy blocks in the sh shared shipping hub, and then you can fully park in the warehouse. Okay, so realistically speaking, that's not gonna all happen because there's only two minutes and um, and spinning the carousel alone can take up the majority of end game. So realistically speaking, in autonomous, you could um, put the preloaded freight in any level of the team shipping hub because it all scores points and just drop the duck from the carousel because arguably it's really easy and then uh, park in the storage place. And then for teleop, uh, put the freight scored in any level of the Alliance shipping hub. And then uh, you can also put freight in the shared shipping hub. And for end game, you spin the carousel to get a max of 48 points. You tip the shared hub and then you fully park in the warehouse. Vincent, you're so good. for the for the drivetrain or the chassis of your robot, uh, there for this game there are constraints. Your robot has to be eighteen by eighteen by eighteen inches, and it has to um, stay outside the, of the weight limit. Next slide, please. And uh, your robot has to. Or this is because the robot has to travel through the barriers. Next slide. So here are some ideas of what you should you can do for your drivetrain options. So the one on the left is called the differential drivetrain, and this drivetrain uh, has wheels or regular wheels on the sides of the robot, and has one wheel in the middle to help it uh, go left left and right and up and down. So using this drivetrain is 
probably a, a really common drivetrain for teams and because you can create traction with the floor and uh but its cons is that it can't stray to align with the game piece or goal so for the right one it's or it's called the mechnum drivetrain and this uses mechnum wheels which allow the robot to steer or to like turn and go places where the differential drive can can't because they only have straight wheels. So some of the pros for this drive train is that it can move side to side for alignment, be lower, and it can also, it's also lower to the ground with the 75 millimeter drive train. Some of the cons is that some of these mechanism wheels have trouble going over the barrier. Like some of the recent mechanism wheels that came out, they can't get over the barrier. And it also requires two extra motors so you would probably need to find a taller mechanism wheel to get over the barrier for this, but it's an easy fix. Next slide. Oh. So the intake requirements are that you have to be able to touch the piece and then you have to be able to like, like bring in the piece into your robot or else when you, um, when you move away from the piece, it just like you just leave it there. So there's no point if it can't own the own the freight. And then it also has to be adaptable because there's three different weights for the for the blocks, and uh, uh, there's also a circle, uh, a sphere shaped uh, freight. So it has to be able to pick up all four of those. Else, uh, the drivers are gonna have a really hard time. Uh, and then. It's really helpful if you design um, your intake to only pick up one. So during autonomous, you can easily program it uh, so that um, you can go into the warehouse, randomly pick up one, and then not worry about it picking up multiple and um, uh, getting a penalty. And you also have to have a way to release it. If you can't release it, there is really no point in bringing it in because there's uh, no way for you to score points. Okay, so the first uh, idea is arm intake. Um, some of the pros are that you can easily grab the piece and you can easily make it um, limited to only grab one. But the problem is when you um, when you bring the arm up, uh, it's not really reliable because it doesn't um, give enough pressure so that the piece doesn't fall down. Uh, the second way is a side roller intake. Um, some of the pros is that if you angle it correctly, it can easily bring in the piece and you can easily modify it so that it can only bring in one piece. The con is that uh, it's really heavy. It uses two motors. And uh, to use this, um, it's uh, if you put it on an arm, then it's really hard to uh, for your arm to be able to uh, be able to hold it up uh, without falling. And so if you don't angle it correctly, the tubing can easily just, um, can easily push the blocks away from your robot instead of putting them in your robot. Okay, the last idea is roller intake. Um, it, it just really fits everything. It's portable, it's small and, um, if designed uh, correctly, it, it only um, intakes one block and it, it's pretty reliable. So the carousel is arguably the easiest mechanism and it can also score the most points. So the carousel, for the carousel, your um, little wheel, your spinning wheel has to be reliable so that it doesn't fall off. Um, there has to be a balance of power so it doesn't um, just suddenly speed up and the duck doesn't, um, the duck doesn't uh, just fly off. And then it, I recommend it to be simple because if it's too um, complex, then it's really hard to put on your robot. And there's no need to make this uh, really like difficult. 
uh, you just have to attach a wheel to a servo. And then uh, since the carousel is 12.5 inches above the tile floor, then uh, you can just attach it 12.5 inches above the tile floor. So easy. And then the carousel wheel is 16 inches in, the, in diameter. So you can easily use that to calculate how much uh, you, your wheel needs to spin. And I recommend going at a slower pace rather than a, fa a faster pace because um, during, because the wheel has to like completely stop before the human player can put another duck on it. So if you cause it to spin too fast, then inertia will cause the wheel to continue spinning, which will actually result in a slower time than just a reliable uh, slow spinning wheel. And also if it goes too fast, the duck can fly off and it'll be invalid. So here's some delivery mechanism uh, ideas for the fright, for the frights. So the first one that we thought was the best was the elevator mechanism. It's, it's what you think it is. It's basically a pulley with string attached to it and basically, uh, yeah, it pulls it and and the second one or oh wait no it's numbered one so that was the second one so the first one is called the four bar linkage and this mechanism is a, sing a single jointed arm that's positioning of the intake relative to the goal so uh yeah, it's just another way you can deliver your fright. Okay, so thank you. This concludes our presentation. And do you guys have any questions? Um, something I forgot to add at the beginning, um, all the people that answer questions get to be um, in, gets into a giveaway drawing of I think a $25 Amazon gift card. So um, anyone who asks a question um, gets into there. So that's some incentive to ask. Oh, and uh, your robot does not have to put the custom shipping element. It's just recommended. It, you can put the duck and um, However, if you do get the correct like layer of the shipping hub, you only get a 10 point bonus instead of a 20 point bonus if you put your duck there. So the shipping element is recommended because it can get you more points. Um, can you specify on what you mean by, is it legal to put a barcode on custom shipping element? The barcode is just like a piece of tape on the floor. It's like last year, there was this uh, piece of tape where you put the, the stack of rings. It's basically like that, except you put your a uh, custom piece there. Um, you can put like a real barcode. It's just like, if it doesn't affect the opponent's robot, then it's fine. Um, the custom piece, uh, it starts on the floor if you decide to put it there. If not, um, you can use the carousel to spin it onto the floor where you can uh, pick it up. So for the mechanism wheels, uh, some of the newer versions won't go above the barrier. So you'll have to buy like a lot of samples or some samples to see which ones go over and which ones don't. I don't really know right now.
I would recommend getting um, larger Mechnum wheels so they don't get stuck between the gap of like the two pipes and stuff. Hello, can y'all hear me? Yes. Um, so that I think we ran out of time for y'all. Um, thank you so much for talking. And uh, next we have, um, since uh, before they had some technical issues, but they're back now. So um, please welcome uh, team 9879 with engineering design process. Yeah, I just want to make sure if uh, my screen share works. Yeah. Okay. Uh, all right, so apologies. Uh, my Zoom wasn't updated and the version that I had didn't have any breakout rooms in it. So that was the issue, but now we're okay. So yeah. Um, hello, my name is Ezra. And my name is Ethan. Uh, we are from Team 9879, Route Negative 1, and we are based in Don Tyson School of Innovation in Springdale, Arkansas, USA. We are second year members of the team, and, and uh, we were nominated as the Dean's List semifinalist for the ultimate goal season last year. We are very glad to be part of this workshop. For our presentation, we will be talking about our engineering design. We will be using slides from our engineering portfolio in last year's game, Ultimate Goal. However, it is good to note that we roughly follow this plan every year. Okay, so uh, everything that we do stems from our three-year strategic plan. Our engineering design is based on the mission and strategic actions, so the uh, these rectangles, um, to, uh, to three parts of the strategic plan, which is a mechanical design and control system, it's the first two columns. Um, so it is good to note that uh, everything that we do is not actually uh, in this strategic plan, is it's just a rough guide that everyone follows. Additionally, uh, at the end of the ultimate goal season, we actually graded ourselves in order to evaluate uh, how well we did in terms of following the three-year strategic plan. This is how we visualize our engineering design timeline. First, we identify the system and subsystem requirements for the game, and then we develop and test subsystem prototypes in which we get information. After that, we assemble all of the prototypes after gathering information to a development of 3D CAD for a full prototype design. After fully prototyping, we then fabricate, assemble, and test the full prototype robot. Using that information, we then update the CAD for a final competition robot. Then we next fabricate, assemble, and test the final competition robot. We also meet with an advisory panel consisting uh, of an engineer with Airborne Systems in Pennsylvania, an FRC coach from Houston, Texas, and one of our alumni who is now a computer, computer science student at Rice University. Additionally, we write a detailed engineering notebook as a documentation of the whole engineering design process. For years, however, we, uh, we used this workspace organizing software called Trello. So before we wrote everything in the engineering notebook, we would make cards in, these, uh, in Trello, um, and these cards are uh, within separate lists, and we describe the cards, we attach images and videos, set deadlines if necessary, and there's a feature where you can add a checklist so that every member can track uh, our own progress. And uh, we have two separate boards. We have the non-engineering robotics board and the engineering robotics board. Um, as you can see in the picture, it, this is about the boards are like outreach, promotion, and all that stuff. That's for the non-engineering robotics board. But for engineering notebook, before we wrote all of this stuff, we, we had cards first in the engineering board in, uh, in Trello. So moving on to the first stage of our um, design process, um, we would do a whole meeting. We spend several hours first discussing the game and its rules. And then right after, we don't do any designing and prototyping. We just uh, we decide on our system and subsystem requirements. So you can see there's a huge list here. Um, there's like an autonomous strategy, um, drivetrain and control requirements, and different requirements for each subsystem. Um, as you can see, some of these are actually crossed out because in the middle of the build season, we they were deemed uh, either inefficient and or uh, unnecessary. So for example, number two in the initial autonomous strategy is launch three rings at power shot targets. 
in an ideal world, launching three rings at power shot targets is really good, but the risk of not hitting three ring, uh, not hitting three power shot targets all the time outweighs the benefits of actually hitting all of them. Um, and so that was removed. And some of these actually have a red font, and that was because they were added in the middle of the build season. So for example, uh, so the power shot targets were crossed out. If you see number four in the autonomous strategy below, there's a there's a launch three rings at high goal was uh, had a red font because we added them when we crossed out the power shot targets because we almost always hit three rings at the high goal during autonomous, and so mathematically um, we we were better off shooting three rings at the high goal all the time. So another example of the red font thing is the number eleven in autonomous strategy to collect and score the second wobble goal. We participated in uh, remote scrimmages and remote uh, and the Alabama remote tournament. Um, and we realized that we had time in autonomous to score a second wobble goal for extra points. And so, yeah, that was it for the, that's it for the subsystem and subsystem requirements. I'd also like to add that our final competition robot has more than 30 fabricated custom design parts. As we worked through our design process, we improved our mechanism using the information we gathered from the prototypes. For instance, we improved the drivetrain by reducing the weight and improving the rigid structure. We stuck with the mechanism, however, because we did not feel a need to go any other way. We improved the wobble goal system, subsystem by making the arm more compact and stable, increasing the gripper's surface area, and making it easier to preload the wobble goal. The gripper increased surface area allowed for the driver to have a much easier time and save us very valuable time when scoring the wall goal during the end game. Uh, in ring launching, we made adjustments and improvements to the flywheel, magazine, and trigger for our shooting system. We also attached the launcher at a 26 degree angle to give ourselves a wide shooting range. And so let's move on to the control system. So this is actually like a common like uh, flaw in a lot of teams, including our team in the past. It's uh, not including the control system components, uh, which is uh, the electronics and all that stuff at the beginning of the initial design process. And that usually leads to uh, sizing problems, accessibility problems, and most of the time just messy wiring. And so for last year's season, ultimate goal, our team did the best that we could to incorporate all the electronics, all the control system components into the, uh, into the initial design. So I'd actually like to show um, the slide from the drivetrain. And so the two final stages of the drivetrain, which is our prototype drivetrain and the final drivetrain, you can see here that we actually left a lot of space for electronics and passed and left also some extra space for the other uh, subsystems. And so we we planned the wiring ahead. We uh, we didn't have any sizing and or accessibility problems. We tried to minimize it. And of course that bore fruitful results. Um, we leave uh, typically one or two weeks before competition to completely test our robot under tournament conditions. We record all scrimmages and lay out detailed statistics so that we're informed on what we need to work on. For the ultimate goal season, statistics were used to continuously improve our autonomous and driver control period. That is all for our engineering design. Uh, thank you for having us and we are glad to answer any questions you may have. And I will be stopping my screen share. But if you guys have any questions, you can uh, put it in the chat. Well, if nobody has any questions, then we'd like to thank you guys for giving us the opportunity to present our design process and giving us the time to speak. Thank you very much.
there's a question, will the slides be available online? Um, I think we can. Uh, I think we can share that. I don't know how the process works, though. Um, I'm gonna, I'm gonna message uh, one of the higher ups on how to actually share it. Um, but yeah, uh, I'll try to make the slides available online. Yep, no problem. I'm sorry, uh, my computer just unfroze. It was frozen the entire time you're speaking. But um, next we have team 8565. And the ne next presentation is from the host team 8565, one of the strong teams in North Texas and strong adv advocates for promoting STEM education in the community. Their newest team members are going to talk about some basics of FTC and sensors in this beginner track. This is FTC Actuators and Sensors 101 presented by Team 8565. Uh, hello, my name is Isaac. I'm eighth grade. I go to Rice Middle School and I like playing video games. Hi, I'm Michael. I also go to eighth grade. I go to Rice Middle School and I like food. So today we're going to be going over types of actuators and when to use which. Uh, DC motor rules and programming. Uh, and we're gonna be going over like motor modes and and like demo, like the difference. Uh, we're gonna also be going over rules and servo programming, and we're gonna go over sensor uh, usage and rules. On the right is the Rev Robotics Mechanum chassis, which uses four DC motors. Servers are good for smaller, more precise items, such as a shooter trigger. On the left is a shooter trigger <clears throat> from the A565 CAD used in Ultimate Goal. The Ultimate Goal season, the Wobble Goal is pretty heavy, which is a good example of boundary scenario for deciding on DC motor versus servo. You can to lift the arm, you could use a DC motor, but to actually grab the wobble goal, you could just use a servo to grip it. So in the season, some teams used a DC motor for the actual arm, but some teams like uh, 18227, which was my old team, we used um, a really high torque servo, such as the Sav Saver rope servo, which can cost like $150. So what types of DC motors are used? So on the screen, these are like, um, I'm pretty sure it's most of the legal motors that you can use, um, such as the Corhex uh, Rev HD Planetary, which you can switch to gearboxes. You can have one, two, or three gearboxes. Um, you can have the Tectrix motor, and you have the Gobilla Yellow Jacket motor, which depending on the gear ratio, uh, I mean, the gear ratio is dependent on the size of the yellow jacket motor, which, com which comes into consideration of when you're making a robot. So how to control a motor in Java? Well, you just have the initialization, which is pretty simple. And then to actual like run the motor, you can set the motor power between zero and one. One would be full power, zero would be to stop it. So to control a motor in Java, 
you have um you can set the direction to forward or reverse and then you can set the behavior to break or float um there are four different motor modes you can set the first one is run without encoder which pretty much doesn't use the reading of the battery although you could still read encoder values despite the name run without encoder the next one is run using encoder, which is pretty much the same as without encoder, except it can use the reading of the battery to run amount, the right amount of speed. Run to position, pretty much it has the motor turned to a specific position that you tell the motor to using a PID velocity system. And then finally, the last one, stop and reset encoder, just resets the encoder value. So what is the difference between the modes? Well, with encoder, as you can see on the right, it's not really accurate because like the heading is like not using PID. So like basically it's just, just to illustrate a demonstration on the speed. So without encoder, it's much faster because um, the encoder reading, I mean, without encoder, it doesn't rely on the battery reading so it just runs tech it should run faster than with encoder because with encoder uses the battery reading and then target to position will uh basically um it gets like faster until it gets to target decision and then stays on that position as you can see it's getting faster and faster And then it just stays this amount of speed. Servos move to a specific position, unlike motors, which run off power. There's also the continuous servo that does actually run off power. Commonly used FTC servos are the Rev Smart servo, which has a range of 270 degrees and is also able to be programmed. The other one is the Go Build a 2000 series dual mode servo, which has a range of 300 degrees. As fat as it comes in three variations: speed, super speed, and torque. Well, unlike the Rev servo, Rev only has one variation, and actually, the Go Build a ones are actually they're both programmable, not just the Rev one. This is how you initialize the servo. And in auto, it pretty much just turns the servo 0 0.5 rotations. And the bottom one, it pretty much, the servo turns to how much you press the gamepad right trigger. So if you press it more, it'll turn more. And if you don't press it, it just goes back to its default position. And you can also set the position in Teleop by using like a key. And you can even use like the analog stick to like give it more diverse like um values. So for sensors, uh any sensor is compatible. Any sensors that are compatible are allowed. So uh basically if you can plug it into the control hub or the expansion hub, it's basically allowed. Um so like mostly used sensors are touch, color, distance, in some cases, magnet limit switch. And on the screen, you can see different pictures of each one. The touch sensor returns a Boolean value to indicate whether it's pressed or not. It plugs into the digital channel. In Skystone, we used it to detect if a brick is in the intake system so we could close the auto, so it could automate the claw close. So in this video, like it's gonna show like how the brick is intaked and how the robot reacts. So as you can see, the brick touches this pad, which is actually um, much bigger than the actual touch sensor like button because like this button is very small. So by using this pad, the 
brick can like be detected. And then it like flashes red LED lights and the claw automatically closes. Because in the sky zone season, the driver actually sometimes forgets to close a claw inside. So by using this, it can help the drivers a lot. This is how to initialize the touch sensor. You set the mode to input, so it pretty much just tells you whether it's pressed or not. And the bottom one is a method to return the touch sensor state, which is pressed or not. So for color sensor, it returns a boolean and double value. Uh, it's plugged into the I2C channel, and it was used in relic recovery to detect the red and blue ball. So as you can see, this is the color sensor on the end. Uh, well, you can't really see it. It's a little bit out of frame, but it's supposed to be here. And it detects either if it's red or blue and then knocks it off. And how to use it? Well, you initialize it using this. And then basically in this code, it detects Q value, which is HSV values. And then this is an array, which is supposed to be for Q value and saturation. But in this case, zero is in one in Java. So it's Q value. And then you have, you compare it to the Q value. So you can compare it to 15 and 24, which is the Q values for red. And in this case, if the color sensor detects red, then you can set the motor power to zero. This is the distance sensor. It returns double, and it's also plugged into the I2C channel. Sometimes it can be incorporated into the color distance sensor, so you only need one sensor to run both the color and distance sensor. In Rover Ruckus, we used to detect how many cubes or balls were in the robot intake system. So as you can see in this video, when you're intaking, uh, wait. so the LEDs actually flash. Oh, shoot. So as you can see, the LED actually flashes when two are in. And then there's actually two distance sensors to detect if there's three. And if there's three, it will tell the driver to like spit one out because you can only have two cubes or uh, balls in this intake that season which is kind of like this season but last season uh i mean rover ruckus it, you can intake more and you didn't have to go in like the warehouse so how to use it well you initialize it and then in this uh, code you basically compare it to how many inches so if it's less than one inch you set the motor power to zero which is kind of like the color sensor, except it's getting the distance instead of the hue value. This is the IMU. It's embedded in the Rev Hub, which could be expansion or control hub. It works by integrating tiny acceleration changes over time and can return your heading, pitch, and roll. It's very effective for turning a specific angle using PID or a P controller. And it can also redrift over time but it becomes inaccurate after around one minute of movement for absolute angle. This is how to initialize the IMU. And in the middle code, this is very important if you want to get the heading. We pretty much just set the axis reference intrinsic axis order angle unit to degrees. So it returns degrees, you can set it to radians and sadly not gradients, only radians and degrees. And at the bottom, it turns right for 90 degrees, and then it sets the power to zero. So basically, um, the IMU, when you initialize it, basically it gets like the first angle your robot is oriented. So for the magnet limit switch, basically it, re it returns a Boolean value. Um, it pl it's plugged into the digital channel and it detects movement on the robot, like on the linear slide.
So in this case, the map minute limit switch was used to detect its limit. So basically in the season, you didn't need really a middle position when you're stacking the stone. You could go like as um, short as possible or like as long as possible. There's not really a middle position. So that's like a perfect opportunity for the magnet limit switch because it detects, um, it can like detect the limit. Um, this is a little reminder to uh, wrap up the presentation. You have about uh, two minutes left. So try to like wrap it up. Okay, so we can get to questions. So when you use a magnet limit switch, you initialize it, and then you get um, the state, which is like a Boolean value. So it's kind of like the touch sensor. And in this case, you set power to one when the limit switch is triggered, which is the Boolean value right here. So any questions? How does a distance sensor work? Uh, it uses, I think it uses like color and infrared like reflection. To sort of detect how far no, how far away it is using sort of like how long it takes for the light to bounce back. Um. All right. Next question. Can you go into more detail on using encoders that are in the motors? Um. We have time for like about like one more question. So. Uh, you talking about this? So like in general, the encoders are like, it can like get your amount of rotation and like hitting. So like, let's say if I was turning, I mean, so like motor encoders can like measure, I guess amount of rotations. So like if I was going straight for 10 inches, basically I can, so basically I can like, uh, set an encoder value to convert it into inches. I guess if that's what you're asking. So um, thank you so much for us uh, speaking today. Um, next we have team 18 to, um, 227. Um, and they're speaking about code version control. Okay, I'm just gonna get straight into this. Okay, so my name is Joshua Joshua Yi. FTC, so I'm fairly new to this. Okay, so I'm gonna be going over version control, and then I'll I'll be going to, and you can uh, feel free to follow along while I'm doing that. Okay, so uh, why is version control important? Does anyone have any ideas? Okay, well, version control basically shows the history of your project. And that's basically um, the, the edits you've made and when you made them. So you can sort of think, it, think of it like, um, Google, like Google Slides or Google Docs. Like uh, you can, you can see your past edits and then revert back to them whenever you want. So uh, Git also allows you to recover your data. So, for example, if you if you if you accidentally um, like make a change you don't like, you can revert to a previous version. Uh, yeah. So. 
Uh, yeah, so it Git only stores the information on your computer. So say you're like your computer, your computer gets damaged somehow. Imagine you, you you're like using a Chromebook and it somehow explodes, right? Well, the code was stored on like the information was stored on your computer, and so you can't really access it. And the the backup, which is um, stored using version control, was also on your computer. So you've lost you've lost all your data, and there's basically no way of recovering it. But that's where GitHub comes in. Yeah, so that's uh, this is really important. Git stores uh, the data locally, which means um, it stores it on your computer. Yeah, and that's where GitHub comes in. So GitHub uh, is a way to um, like host your host your projects online. So it's sort of like Google Drive, right? Because you can like upload your projects, and then you can, and then GitHub also allows you to work with other, uh, collaborate with other people. And that's really important when in FTC, since you, it's not just one programmer like uh, writing code, you have a lot of people working on it. So yeah, some important terms to know are repository, commit, and push. Uh, these are really simple. Repository is just like uh, your project. Commit is saving locally to, to Git, and then, when you want to save it to GitHub, which is uh, online, it, you just push whatever you want. Yeah, so feel free to ask me any questions, but I'm gonna, I'm actually gonna demo this, uh, like how, how to use version control. So to, so cloning is just downloading, like basically down, making a copy of whatever you want. So uh when you find yeah and feel feel free to follow along if you have like git and android studio yeah so um to clone you can either just download it and then unzip it like that or you can uh copy the link of whatever you want to download and then go into what, whatever folder you want and then you can do git clone and then paste the link and that'll that'll also download it yeah, you can see that. Yeah, it it does the same thing, but it's like much much faster. So I've already downloaded this. So yeah, so uh, once you have this, you can once you download it, you can just open it, and then yeah, to upload it to GitHub, you can you simply make a new repository, and then yeah, so to set up version control, uh. It's it's very simple. So you first go to version control, the version control tab uh, at the top, and then just enable version control, and then select Git, since that's what we're using. Yeah, and then uh, yeah. So you have to actually like push it to the repo. So uh, first, yeah. So commit. Or uh, if if you remember from earlier, is just saving to your to like look to get which is local. So if I like add a comment here and then commit, it'll like well I haven't actually committed anything, but yeah. So you can just commit like you can just save it to get and then once you let me just add those real quick. Yeah. And then, this might take a while. Yeah, so then to, so you wanna like upload it to your um, repo. So uh, go to get and then push or you can also push it from up here. And then the remote is where you wanna upload it to. So 
uh, you can simply go to whatever you want, like whatever repo you've created, which you can create over here, GitHub. And then, uh, yeah, so it should be this link. And if you make a new one, it'll look a little different. So let me just show show that really quick. Yeah, so it, it's it's basically the same. It's the same link, just um, without all the other stuff. So um, yeah, so you just paste that link, and then so and then uh, everything you push will go to that uh, specific repo. So yeah, you can see. Um, try to start wrapping up a little bit. Okay, how much time do I have left? Um. You have like a minute. Okay. So yeah, you can see that it like uploads the changes. So so Git uh GitHub is actually pretty uh Git is actually pretty useful. So if I let's say I make a change over here, if you go here, it'll show you what changes you make. So yeah, it shows you like what you change and it'll, and then since it, I haven't committed it yet or anything, it shows up here. And that, yeah, so that's committing and pushing. And then, so to, well, when you're working, when you're collaborating with other people, you wanna receive the changes from them. And that's, that's actually very simple. You can, you just press update project or you can, and press like do that. And then where you can just, pull from the git tab. Um, yeah, so I can demo that really quickly and then that'll probably be it for today. Yeah, so. Um, Yeah, this would be a good time to uh, stop. Uh, thank you so much for uh, talking. Yeah, okay. Yeah, thank you for allowing me to talk about version control. Of course. If you have any questions, please feel free to contact me. Thank you so much for saying talking. Um, next, we have team 18175. Um, the techies. Uh, we have the Techies team, Team 18175, a team and nonprofit organization based in South Charlotte, North Carolina. They are a team of 10 people and two coaches. Um, hello, um, we'll be presenting. <laughs> Um, this is our introduction to outreaching. Like mentioned before, we are the Techies, a second year FTC team. <laughs> um, I'm taking care of someone's pet while they're away. <laughs> Why outreach? For one, it's an intro part of FTC. It can help your team get more people interested in first and robotics, recruit new members, build influence in the community, strengthen your relationships with other teams, help you find sponsors and raise funds, and you can even do better in competition. Some challenges that you might face being maybe a rookie team or you haven't really started doing that much outreaching is that you don't really have many connections to the FTC community. It's hard knowing where to start. It's very time consuming. There's a lot less interest in it, like building, programming, designing, and it's a scary concept, especially to people who haven't done it before. And it has 
it needs skills like communication and presentation. So here are some ways to combat those um, challenges or issues that you might have. Get involved with your local community, look for other teams, go to events like kickoffs, scrimmages, and workshops. Use social media, especially Discord. Join the big FTC server and befriend other teams, start talking. Um, maybe you can even start thinking of alliances that you can form. See if members, coaches, parents, know any other teams and get referrals. Make connections with teams, schedule meetings, chat, or plan an event together. And you can also do outreaching events during the off season when members have more time. Um, invitate, okay. Invitations like these on Discord, like the Freight Frenzy Roundtable discussion are really important and you should go to as many as you can. Here are some more solutions. Start early. In the summer, no one has school unless they go to summer school. No one really has as much stuff as they would during the school season after kickoff. And it's the best time for outreaching because you don't need to focus on robot. You can gauge how much work you need to put in and you can come up with a list of the things that you want to do. Make a plan that has who, what, when, and where. Think of the numbers, how many people will come and how many people are needed to run the event. And then execute and reflect that plan. Take pictures as evidence you can use later. You wanna make sure you document things. Include brainstorming, planning, and what you learned. And I'll let Stephanie take this one. Okay, so these are types of community outreach, um, like events that you can hold or just, yeah. Um, Okay, so the first type of event you can do are camps, so like summer camps, basically. So you can educate younger kids in um, STEM and the FIRST program. So basically, you want to introduce robotics in simpler ways um, that are also like fun and creative. So you want to like make hands-on activities that are probably more interesting than just uh, making younger kids sit through lectures. And normally, these are longer and require a lot of planning because they span uh, over multiple days. Workshops, so like this one, um, this is a workshop. So um, you can host a workshop, you can participate in a workshop, like make a presentation about something your team is good at, or you could just join workshops and learn from other teams who maybe have more experience. Open houses. So these are more like just um, either if you're a school team, you may be during the school open house, just set up a table and introduce them to like the people going to open house or say you're like a community team, maybe you could set up a, a like a just open house in someone's uh, driveway and have people walking by just look at it. And you can use these to recruit members to your team, promote your teams like summer camps or workshops and show off your um, like the achievements you've made as a robotics team and maybe recruit more people or even like potential sponsors, but that's quite unlikely if you're just doing a normal small open house. Uh, mentoring, you can, first you can uh, ask mentors to mentor you. That's a form of outreaching. So get someone who has a um, who has expertise in an area that maybe your team needs help with and they can help your team learn about this, learn about the area. Or you could uh, teach younger or less experienced FTC teams, so like FLL, so younger uh, FTC teams, or you could um, go help out at a nearby school that has a team or open a team in a nearby school, or you could just uh, help mentor local uh, First Lego League teams or First Lego League Explore teams, also called First Lego League Junior. Um, you could also, another um, outreaching form is demos or expos. So basically like you could go to a like science center, um, a school and demonstrate robotics to the general public. So maybe um, 
take like your team's robot and drive it around, show people it. And this can create more interest in robotics with the general public. And also last but not least, probably the most important, use social media to your benefit. So make your team a website, a free website um, creation uh, sites are like uh, Squarespace and Wix. And if you guys wanna make the investment, you can buy your own domain. Um, Instagram, Facebook, YouTube, and having a website and having social media will help like spread the influence of your team. Uh, don't forget to make an email for your team too. I think every team has one, but if you don't, it's really important because if anyone wants to contact your team, you're gonna need to give them an email. And sponsorships and fundraising grow fun. Okay, sorry. Uh, sponsorships and funding. Um, let's start off with uh, fundraising events. They're events held to get money for your team. So that does include bake sales, car washes, t-shirts. Uh, they don't have to be STEM related. So just get creative with whatever you think feels right for your team. Uh, crowdfunding also works, like posting a link to like a GoFundMe on your team's Facebook or Instagram pages uh, to raise money for your team or by uh, going to events and spreading that through word of mouth. Uh, you can receive uh, grants for your team uh, by going to the first website, they have a grants list of uh, companies that uh, will give grants to FTC teams. So you can always go there or you can do your own research and uh, uh, try to get grants from other STEM related companies. Uh, and last is sponsorships. Uh, they are just, they're similar to grants, but they just have other companies give money to your team by like, uh, what's it called? Emailing them and going to their websites and maybe your parents work for a certain company and they might give you sponsorship money through that. Uh, team member dues, this isn't recommended, but if your team needs money and uh, your team members are willing to give money to support the team, then you can always do team member dues. Uh, and any questions? Um, for anyone who wants the link to the slides, I I can put that in chat. Just give me one second. <laughs>
Um, if there are no questions, um, we're moving. Thank you so much for speaking. Um, we're now moving on to giveaway drawings. Um, you will, it will there, we'll draw twice. The first time will be for a twenty-five dollar go go build a store coupon, and then the second drawing will be for two five thousand two hundred three series yellow jacket motors. So, um, Andrew, uh, can you share your screen with with the spinning wheel? And this uh, drawing is for only FTC teams. Um, we're doing two of these drawings, and then the last drawing is going to be for everyone, and it's for whoever asked any questions, and that would be the $25 Amazon gift card. Um, you can spin the wheel, I guess, now. Okay, um, Elise from Team 18797 won a $25 Go Build a Store coupon. Um, we, Elise, we please uh, private message Andrew um, your uh, team email. Wait, let me check uh, the email. The uh, um, the team name, number, um, contact number, and email address. That's what we need. Um, so, if you could work on that, that would be great. And uh, can we, uh, oops, uh, oh, and, um, we're spinning again. Let's see who will get the uh, the motors. Um, I'm so sorry. I don't know how to know how to pronounce your name, but team one one four seven two won the. Uh, let me find the description. The. Five two zero three series yellow jacket motors. Um, would you also please uh, private message Andrew your uh, team name, number, and where he can contact you? contact number and an email address. So who, whoever won, just another little reminder, um, send him the uh, team name, your team number, a contact phone number, and a contact email address. So we can give you what you want. Um, congratulations to uh, the winners. Next, we have team 18227 and David is going to be talking about mechanism drive modes in teleop. Okay, hi, my name is David Hu. Uh, I am a builder on team uh, 18227 ACP area 52. Today I will be teaching uh, how to program mechanism drive in teleop. So here a little bit about me at the St. Mark School of Texas in Dallas. This is my second season participating in First Tech Challenge and my fifth year participating in First Overall. In my free time, I enjoy playing video games and cello. So here's what we're gonna be doing. Uh, first, we're gonna cover how a mechanism chassis works. Basic tank drive code. 
Then another uh, form of uh, driving for mechanism chassis and then called arcade drive and then arcade code. So how does a mechanism chassis work? So a mechanism chassis works really similar to a just a normal six foot chassis, except it has the option to strafe. So for tank drive controls, the code is gonna be the same. Um, move forward with your joysticks or forward, move backward if your joysticks are backward. But then strafing is gonna be different. Since the mechanism wheels have rollers, they have the ability to slide side to side without moving the orientation of the robot. So this is very useful for like lining up. If you wanna line up to a certain place in the field uh, and you don't wanna turn and like re like turn, then it's a lot easier. So strafing, you have to have opposite side motors have the same power. So four motors on the robot, the, the robot, let's say the motor on the left front and the motor on the right back have to have the same power and the motors in the on like the right front and the left back have to have the same value. So here's a little quick demo. You can find the, I, I'll post this website in the chat. So for, let's just say for, first for moving forward, it's just simple. All motors are going forward. All motors are going backwards. Now that's just a normal. Now for strafing, you see left front and then right back are moving the same power. Uh, and then right front and left back are, have the same power. This, uh, whichever direction has like the negative power will basically move to, um, it will move to the robot, will move to that direction. So the, here, I'll share the website in chat for you guys. You can play around with this if you uh, ever, uh, if you have trouble programming the mechanism drive. So, okay. So yeah, so, um, so for uh, this, uh, for straping to the left side, uh, the rollers on uh, the wheels, like these wheels have to line up in an X, like the diagonal line right here has to line up as like a line. And this side also has to line up at like an X. So they intersect in the middle. You can't have the wheels, uh, if you switch the wheels on opposite sides, then uh, the, the strafing won't work. So the, the, the orientation of the wheels uh, is a big uh, part. Now, first uh the left like the right it's uh pretty much the same you just need to change the values for uh strafing so on your controller this is what it would look like basic so tank drive where the, basically the the y-axis on the controllers joysticks controls individual motors uh like on the robot so for example the left motor left uh motor uh, like left joystick would only control the left motor power it, it can't control the right motor um, and then, so the same with the right motor. And then strafing, you can uh, either use buttons like uh, uh, like these, bu like bumpers, uh, that's what they're called, or you can use any like uh, gamepad uh, button that that turns returns a boolean or a like a true false, like if it's pressed or not pressed value. So, so for the code, so basic uh, tank drive is you just set uh, set a variable, assign it the power of like the or like the the value of the uh, joystick at the y axis on the right stick so that would be the right power so this would assign the value for for the right uh, right side and then same for the left side and then you may want to change how based on your motor orientation you may want to change how that this works so for strafing you're going to have to use a button that button on the controller uh, either like the bumpers or any of these four buttons or the d pad uh, to return a boolean. So it, boolean would tell true or false. So you're gonna have to use if statements. So if the left bumper is true, then it will execute this code. If right bumper is true, it will execute this code. So for this, as you can see, I have left motor and a left front and right back have the same value. And then left back and right front have the same value. So uh, if your motors are like mounted different directions that you may wanna play around and see how you can get uh, the strafe to actually work. Um, and also the power on these doesn't have to be exactly one. You can uh, change it to whatever value you would like. So now moving on to arcade drive. So arcade drive is simpler. It only uses two joysticks to control the entire robot. No need for the bump uh, bu buttons to press to strafe. So the X axis on the left joystick or this way, on the left joystick controls uh, strafing, like side to side movement. And then the Y axis controls forward backward. Then the right joystick will control the turning. 
So the benefits of this, uh, it's more accurate controls and allows for diagonal strafing. Instead of having uh, for tank drive, you have to press individual buttons by themselves. You can combine both forward and side to just like strafe diagonally to a place you want, but it's also harder to program. So this is how it would look like on your gamepad controller. So the Y axis on your left joystick or whichever joystick you want, or the right joystick, you uh, the front would be forward and then back uh, would be backwards. Now for straight going to the left, you would go left, strafe left, and then going to the right, you would strafe right. And for turning, you only use side to side for here. So if you moved it to the right side, then your robot would turn right. If you move it to the left side, then your robot would turn to the left. Oh, left, yeah. So here's some uh, code snippets. First, you first need to define where exactly your joystick is in relation to the XY plane. So you assign a value for X and Y first. So you just read the value of the X stick uh, to find out the position on the X axis and then the Y stick to find the position on the Y axis. Uh, you, all, you can also like change the value like it's negative or positive based on uh, how your like motors are mounted. And then for double uh, RX or turning, this would be the right joysticks, uh, X, how, how far along, like where it is on the X axis. So that would control turning. So uh, for the, uh, for the, let's see, uh, for, the, for now applying it to the motors, you, uh, the turning has to, uh, is first like, you first need a uh, either a plus or a minus for turning since left is left left is left side. So say like you want to turn to the uh, to the right, you would make the left power the same and the right power the same. So that's why left is plus plus and then y is minus minus. But this may be different for your robot depending on how you mount your motors. Then you have to define the y like moving forward and backward. The y and uh, forward and backward for everything should be positive. Or if you have any like uh, like motor mounting as uh, then you may want to change it. Then again, so, uh, like left front and right back have to be like the same. They have to have the same power. So that's why you plus x here and then plus x here too, and then minus x minus x. Or you can change these minus the pluses. But as long as the left front and the right back have the same value, and the left back and the right front have the same value, then uh, it should work. So now the clip function you see here uh, is used to limit the uh, like the values that this can be. For example, if you have like uh, y equals uh, one, uh, rx equals like one, then if you had this, it would be one plus one. Uh, and then uh, like if you were to ever have this value go over one, which is like the range the motor can in uh, have a value like set value because motors can only take values from negative one to one. Then the clip function basically takes this value and reassigns it into the range of negative one and one. So here is a demo of how a mechanism chassis should work. So this is basic, and it's, like you, it first goes straight, and then you can also like strafe diagonally. This is for arcade drive though. You can go left side to side without changing orientation. Turning is also available. And yeah, so that's basically how a mechanism drive works. Okay. So some credits I'd like to give uh, for Victor on, on 18227 for building our chassis and then Hank on our team also uh, for making code. So if I have any questions, you can email uh, our team's email at airy52182227 at gmail.com. Any questions? Okay, uh, Nathan, are Omni wheels better or Mechanome? So Mechanome wheels, they, they unlock the ability to strafe. Omni wheels are, they technically don't give you an, uh, like they're, they're used for tank drive. They don't, they're, uh, you could like use them for like six wheel mechanism chassis, but if you want like a robot that can do side to side um, without turning, then a mechanism would be better. But like uh, Omni wheels have like better grip on the ground or mechanism wheels don't have that good of a grip on the ground. So if like the floor is slippery or if like there's 
like if it's on like a solid surface, not on like the FTC playing mat, uh, field, um, then uh, like Omniwheel should be uh, good. So, uh, okay, uh, Ayush, uh, how precise are the mechanism wheels? Um, the, the, the how precise mechanism wheels are depends on how good your code is. Uh, you could have code to override coasting or like if you like turn off the motors and it like slides forward. If you had good code, you could probably prevent it and it automatically stop. But that just all depends on your code. Mechanism wheels are just like any other wheel. They will they'll coast if if you have enough acceleration, and they'll uh, unless you like stop it. And uh, also in uh, okay, Alex, can you use encoders with mechanism wheels? So many teams in like past seasons, like last season, Ultimate Goal, uh, they used encoders or like um, odometry wheels. They they like little middle uh, wheels on the like you can mount inside your robot. To like uh, tell how like where your robot is on the field. Uh, most teams use uh, omni uh, like odometry wheels with mechanism wheels, because like the x because like the x y plane, it, the omni wheel odometry wheels can like help you locate where you are on the field. So yeah, any other questions? Okay, thank you guys. Thanks for speaking. Um, next we have, let's see here, team 12635, and they're gonna talk about the intro to 3D printing. Um, let me see. Curiosity Robotics is a 15 member team from Pablo Alto, California, with four years of experience in FTC. They are presenting an introduction to 3D printing in FTC. Um, I don't know about everyone else, but I can't hear you. All right, can you hear me now? Does that work? Yep, it works. Yep, it works. All right, great. Let's try this again. All right, does it work now? Seem good? All right, I'm just going to start. Uh, hi. I'm Reed, I'm from Curiosity Robotics. Uh, you heard about us, uh, and I'm gonna talk about 3D printing and especially 3D printing in FTC. So let's see, first, what is 3D printing? 3D printing is a manufacturing process that allows you to quickly and easily make custom plastic, 3D, plastic parts from a 3D model. It's incredibly powerful for assisting rapid prototyping and creating complex geometries. So first, let's look at how it works. On the hardware side, 3D printers are just a motion platform with an additive tool head. Additive manufacturing is the opposite of milling or cutting, which are examples of subtractive manufacturing. The key difference is that 3D printers add material to the part as they go. A 3D printer creates objects by depositing thin layers of molten plastic into a specific pattern then repeating that process over and over and over, slowly, slowly building up the part. There are two main parts of the mechanical system, and those are the motion system and the tool head. So the motion system is a mechanism that can move the tool head to any point in the build volume. And the build volume is just where you can print and how much space you can use to create, new, to create objects. The motion system's job is to make sure that the part that melts and deposits the plastic does so at exactly the right place in time. There are many ways to do this, but the most common is just three independent linear axes that control one of the three uh, dimensions in space. 
All right, so the additive tool head is comprised of the extruder and the hot end. The plastic enters the tool head in a long string called filament, and you just buy it from the store that way. But, uh, and the extruder is just a motor that pushes this filament through the hot end, which you're seeing right now, uh, at the right rate. But the hot end is where it all gets interesting because the filament stays cool until it gets to the thin section of the heat break, which you can see in the diagram. And at that point, the temperature of the filament increases from room temperature to around 200 to 300 degrees Celsius, depending on what material you're printing in just over two millimeters. This sharp temperature gradient is super important to prevent jams or the filament gets too soft too early and sticks to the side of the walls, the, sticks to the side of the hot end. The benefit of jams is that they're delicious with bread, but I digress. At the bottom of the hot area, there's the nozzle, which funnels all the molten plastic through a tiny opening, which is normally around 0.4 millimeters. The motion system ensures that when the plastic leaves this tiny nozzle, it immediately gets squished onto the part in the right place, which helps build up the nozzle. Now let's talk about the extruder. So the extruder's job is to push the filament super precisely through the hot end. And it needs to be precise because with the tiny opening in the nozzle, any imperfection will show up as large blobs on the print. So it grabs the filament using gears and a motor, which is pretty simple, and it just bites into the filament and pushes it. And there's two main types of extruders. The first is, the direct, is direct drive and the second is Bowden. So they're very similar in that they both grab the filament with a gear and push it to the hot end. But a Bowden system pushes the filament through a tube and then the tube is connected to the hot end. And normally this means that the extruder can be placed somewhere on the frame where it doesn't have to move. And this is super important because it reduces the moving mass of the print head, which allows you to move faster and have less slop in your motion system. You can think of this like if you had a heavy motor on the end of your linear slides, when the robot moves, it's going to be very floppy. But if you move the motor off the slides and just onto the drivetrain, you can have a lot more precise movement, even if the stiffness of the slides hasn't changed. On a direct drive uh, extruder, it's pretty much the opposite. You put the motor super close to the hot end, so you don't have to use this tube. And this initially might seem bad, but it's pretty good because it minimizes imprecision because when you push filament through a tube, there has to be some slack in order to minimize friction. So by removing this tube, you minimize all the slop that comes with that uh, clearance. And this is important for the precision that we discussed earlier. On the software side, there's three main steps to printing a model. First, you have to create the model using CAD. Other speakers, I believe, will go into this with much more detail, but the idea is that you create a 3D model of the object you want to make. And in this case, I've shown an HTD five millimeter belt pulley. And once you've created it, you export it from your CAD program as a mesh, which is just a bunch of triangles that define the surface of the model. All you need to know about meshes is that they're terrible, but completely awful to work with in CAD, but they are a valid type file type to describe a 3D model. And that's what the slicer likes. So then you take this mesh file and put it through this slicer. The slicer, what it does is it takes the 3D model and cuts it into a bunch of different slices and then generates instructions for the physical machine to create the part. And the reason it cuts it up into a bunch of different slices is the printer creates the models layer by layer. So it has to slice the model into a bunch of different layers. So slicing specifically is very important for the 3D printing process. And the code that it outputs called G code is the instructions for the printer. And so this is pretty important. Um, the slicer is pretty much like a compiler. It takes the human readable input like code, which is a 3D model in our case, and converts it into the simple machine code for the CPU or the 3D printer in our case to run. Um, in this case, the machine code is called G-code, and it's super simple. It is just a really, really long text document with a whole bunch of commands on where to position the tool head and how much to extrude. These files can get super long because they only have linear movements, a simple 
one hour print can be up to 100,000 lines or more. Um, and the reason for this is if you want to do a curve, you have to cut it into a bunch of tiny straight segments. So these can get these uh, files can get very, very long. Um, slicing is very important when printing a model. Also, the right or wrong settings can drastically change the output to the point where you could either get a blog, blob of plastic spaghetti or a perfect print just based on the settings. So let's talk about those a bit. So these are the biggest, most important settings to get right when you're slicing a model. First of all, infill. When you 3D print something, the resulting model isn't 100% plastic. If it were, it would be very heavy and it would take a lot of plastic. And because filament is expensive, we don't want to do that. So we use infill, which is a grid or a pattern, which is normally a grid. It fills in the inside of the part and it gives it structure without taking up a lot of material. Then around that, there are perimeters. Perimeters are how much shell material there are there is around the infill. So if you put one perimeter, it's going to be not a super strong part, and you might be able to see the infill through the perimeters. But if you put five perimeters, it's going to be pretty strong because the perimeters are the shell around the infill, and they really help to prevent buckling of the part when it's stressed. Another setting is layer height, and this is important because it really affects how fast the prints are. One major problem with 3D printing is the speed. Granted, it's a lot faster than traditional methods like milling or buying a part and having it shipped to you, but it still takes a while. The belt pulley that we discussed earlier on the thickest layer height I could set it to took around half an hour to make. So the layer height is how thick each of the layers are that build up the part is. And the thinner it is, the higher resolution you'll get but the thicker it is, the faster the print will go. So it's a big trade-off here. And then material is simple. What plastic are you using? Personally, for our team, we've never used anything other than PLA because PLA, which is the standard cheap stuff that you can get for about $20 a kilogram, it, it works. It's strong enough. It's easy to print. You know, There's no reason really in FTC to go beyond that because materials can get ridiculously expensive if you look into them and it's just at least for FTC and the stresses in FTC, it's not, it hasn't been worth it for us. Now, one more important thing is support material. So you can't just print something in midair, right? That'd be really cool, but no, you can't. So support material, it material is extra stuff that you put underneath your part uh, so that you can print large overhangs or anything that might be in midair if you didn't have the support. And then after you uh, finish, after the part is finished printing, you have to take off the support material. So one important thing when designing for 3D printing is that you wanna minimize the amount of support material needed because it's waste material, which is bad for your wallet because filament is expensive and bad for the environment because you know plastic is bad to throw away. And also it's a, it's a pain to take off your part. So yeah, if you want to keep your thumbs, minimize the support, support material. And then these last few settings are, I'll just go through them really quick. They're less important. Line width is how thick you want the line to be that you're laying down. So it's kind of like perimeters, but for everything, it's just the thickness of the lines. Um, cooling, you need to cool a plastic after it comes out of the hot zone for it to solidify because if your plastic is still molten, when you're trying to put the next layer on top of it, it's going to be really hard and it's all going to collapse. And then brim is just a extra material that you put around the base to make it stick down to the bed better. And sticking to the bed is one big problem in 3D printing. It's kind of hard to get when you're starting out. And adhesion is very important because if your part starts moving around on the print bed, I mean, it's going to be very hard to create a functional part. All right, so those are some main slicing settings. They're pretty important. If you want to really learn learn about printing, you might want to go through more settings, but pretty much this is all you'll need to start. Now let's look through 3D printing specifically for FTC. So 3D printing has a lot of benefits for FTC teams. It allows 
creation of super complex and accurate parts without having to wait for shipping or paying for expensive manufacturing services. Additionally, 3D printing forces that was red, that's red, is 3D printed. You can see that without 3D printing, we would have no way to make the rollers that hold the polycord bands in the intake, or no way to create a stable camera mount that conforms to the shape of the camera. Additionally, we print all our belt pulleys instead of buying them. This allows us to rapidly experiment with many different belt ratios. 3D printers have also become so much cheaper in recent, recent years that it's affordable to buy one and all the benefits that you can see with increased uh, or decreased cycle time when iterating your designs and all these other things, these are very important and great benefits of 3D printing. So let's talk more about CAD quickly. I know other speakers will talk about this. Um, I think the next person is going to talk about CADing your robot, but quickly it's just making a 3D model before you go build things. And this is useful because you can conceptualize your design and make your design quickly without having to physically make it. And this really increases how fast you can iterate your designs and kind of look, look at them. Because once you can see your design, it's really helpful. And also once you can CAD things, you can 3D print them. And that is incredibly powerful. Um, another benefit of CAD is that you can get fancy renders. Who doesn't like those? Especially judges. I'm pretty sure they like those a lot. Um, yeah, those are nice. All right, so let's look at some drawbacks of 3D printing. The only problems with 3D printing and the CAD that comes with it are the cost, the learning curve, and the strength of the prints. So 3D printers have gotten a lot cheaper recently, but they're still around $200 plus 20 kilograms or $20 per kilogram of filament. If your budget is tight, this could be a problem. There's also the additional cost of the time needed to learn how to use the printer and how to use CAD. Hopefully this presentation and workshop in general can help with that, but it's still going to be a problem and you're going to have to put in some time if you want to learn CAD or, or 3D printing. The biggest problem with prints is the strength. 3D print, prints are plastic. You can't get it. We, as in Curiosity Robotics, have never had any major problems with this. You just need to know the limitations of the material and the process. So an example of this would be like if you wanted to create a part and you could either cut it out of aluminum or 3D print it, the, th the 3D printed part is going to have to be a lot bigger. It might be lighter, it might be faster to make, but it's still going to have to be bigger to compensate for the lack of strength in the plastic. Furthermore, while additive manufacturing is a big improvement over traditional methods, it still has limitations on the geometry it can produce. We talked about supports earlier. You have to design around that, and you have to design around the fact that maybe some details are too small to reproduce. And finally, 3D printed parts are anisotropic, meaning that they have different strength in different directions. They are always, almost always weaker along the layer lines. You can see in the diagram, it's kind of like wood. If you pull wood apart uh, so that the grain can split apart, it's not going to be very strong. But if you try to pull with the grain so that the grains are acting like fibers, it's going to be a very, very strong material. And 3D prints are the same way. This isn't a huge problem as long as you take this into account when you're designing your part. For example, if you took a long vertical, let's say you were printing a long cylinder and you are sorry, a long rectangular prism and you printed it upright so it was super tall, if you tried to bend it, it would break a lot easier than if you had printed it horizontally because of the direction of the layer lines. Other than these problems, however, 3D printing is incredibly versatile and super helpful in FTC. So yeah, I would encourage everyone to at least try it. It's gonna take a lot of learning and it is something to learn, you know, so it'll take that time. But other than that, it's super helpful. And yeah, that's it. So I'm just gonna say thanks for listening. And if anyone has any questions, either technical or overall, I'd be happy to answer them.
Thank you for sharing this with me. Thank you for sharing this with me. So I got one question um, from Alex. Can you CAD something printable in Tinkercad? Of course, you can totally do that. Um, Tinkercad is super great for learning how to CAD stuff. Um, yeah, it's not super sophisticated. So once you, you get beyond simple designs, you want to learn something more powerful like Fusion or Onshape or SolidWorks if you're willing to spend the money. but Totally. Tinkercad is great if you're just doing small, simple parts or if you're learning. Yeah. Um, I think we have to move on now. Um, thank you so much for speaking. And next we have... Um, team 18092. Um, Twin Turbo from Frisco, Texas is here today to present how CAD and Fusion 360 helped their team get invited to the Texas Cup. Okay, so give me one second, let me pull it up. Can everyone see the screen? Yep. Okay, so our, my, my presentation is going to be about using Fusion 360 to model essential components. So Fusion 360 is a simple and free software to use. Here is a QR code to downloading your own version of Fusion 360. You could get a personal slash hobby license from Autodesk for free, but this does not give you access to certain features such as generative design which is an AI-assisted design process that creates efficient but strong parts, or simulation. However, for many teams, the free version of Fusion 360 is perfect for their applications. So Fusion 360 is not only important for creating 3D printed parts, it also aids with the planning and assembly of the robot. On the left is the hopper, flywheel, and servo mechanism from Ultimate Goal that our team used. Fusion 360 help does integrate all, all of them in the perfect harmony to make the most efficient hopper design and to reduce the time to unload the hopper. And on the right is a really crude picture of our robot. Due to the pandemic before building a robot, we used Fusion 360 in order to model the robot in order to check the placements before we build. This saved us a lot of time in this sense. We didn't put extreme, uh, like, an extreme amount of detail, but we put just enough so we knew that we would have enough time and we knew the design of the robot beforehand. So our team primarily uses geometric figures in order to model different components. We use the sketch function on the left and the extrude function on the right. And the, the sketch function creates a 2D drawing of the component we wanna make and we use the extrude function to give that 2D drawing depth. So here's a video of just a simple base plate with a few screw holes that we would make. So initially we would start off by using the sketch function and choose the plane we wanna draw on. Then we use, we draw a, a geometric figure and we have to, specify the parameters, the exact uh, length and width of the rectangle. Next, we would use the extrude function to give this depth. And we would specify, say, five or 10 millimeters based on whatever your needs are. And this time, instead of selecting a normal plane, we select the location on the piece that's already extruded, which is technically called the body. So we draw on the body and in order to make screw holes, we use the circular function within the sketch functions themselves. And we create holes within the top of the 
rectangular bracket. And for this too, we specify the exact um, the exact radius that it would need to be. Next, the peculiarity of the extrude function is you can also negative extrude. So what happens when you negative extrude is instead of adding material, you're, te you're taking it away. So when you negative extrude, you take away the, uh, the material that would have been used to fill in the screw hole. And that's a really easy way of using Fusion, using Fusion 360. But along with this, you can add many more layers and many more components to it. So this is just a brief overview of how to create a simple component. However, one can create intricate and complicated designs by layering multiple extrudes and geometric figures on different planes of view. Here's a video of our development process throughout last year. So there were like many, there were many, many steps that we had to do in our in order to come up with the final result. And this included first, we, we started off with the base plate at the bottom of the hopper. Then we built on from there. We knew that we needed to have a guide to hold, the, to hold in the rings. That's why we created this semicircle and extruded it. Next, we plan to use a guide over here so that we can uh, push against the ring to provide compression. And we put that there too. And if we go back into the, over here, you can see how we integrated the 3D models of the flywheel, the ring, the servo, and the mounting bracket in order to make sure all the parts fit together. This is relatively easy as you are provided with a library of uh, parts already uh, scanned and put into CAD. So all you need to do is go onto GoBuilder or any mark or, or Rev's website and download the models from there. And from there, it's pretty simple. You design your part, you import the different pieces that you're gonna be using, and you kind of build around that so that you don't need to have the physical part with you right then and there to build it. And that's pretty much it. Any questions? Okay, so Fusion 360 is relatively light. You don't need uh, extremely heavy or a gaming computer or anything like that. Majority of it is done in the cloud. So all you need is a computer with a decent amount of RAM, say like eight or 16 gigs, and maybe a processor that can carry out normal functions. Anyone else? Um, if that's it, um, next we have, um, Lucas from Techies 18175 to des to teach us how to design a drivetrain. All right. Um, can everyone hear me okay? Yep. All right, perfect. Um, I'm just going to share my screen. Can everyone see that? Yep. All right, uh, I'll start then. So, <clears throat> um, oh. all right, so, uh, so just a quick about uh, me and our team. Uh, we're Techies Robotics, uh, second year at PC Engine and we're located uh, in Charlotte, North Carolina. Um, and my name is Lucas. I'm an eighth grader, uh, coincidentally, in Charlotte, North Carolina. And this is my second year doing FTC. So just a quick agenda for today. Um, this is like quite a lot to cover, but I'll try to cover it all. So uh, we'll start with 
uh, what makes a good drivetrain, uh, common drivetrain designs, um, and then like my opinions for like drivetrains this year. Um, and then we'll go into some stuff about CAD, like why it's useful, uh, use cases for FTC and FTC CAD software. And then um, <clears throat> we'll look at like uh, specific FTC CAD software design workflows, um, some clarification on so, uh, like certain parts, um, specific part, part workflows, helpful tips and helpful resources. Uh, so let's get started. Um, <clears throat> so what makes a good draft chain? Um, making a good drivetrain boils down into a few important factors. So the first is reliability. Um, your drivetrain is essentially the backbone of your robot. So even if you have the world's greatest scoring mechanism, it's not going to matter if your drivetrain fails in the middle of the round. Um, so the goal of a drivetrain is to make it really as robust as you possibly can, um, make it um, like withstand like defense or like collisions and all that. Um, and then the second is speed versus torque. Uh, so everyone knows what speed is, but um, torque might be an unfamiliar term. Uh, and torque basically describes um, the force of something or how much pushing power it has, and they're inversely related. So the more speed you have, the less torque, and the less speed you have, the more torque. Um, and generally, it's good for drivetrains to have speed, but you also want to have enough torque to move around a heavy robot uh, and play defense if you need. Um, so the optimal speed for drag trains is usually around four, uh, four and a half to six feet a second. Um, and then the final thing is maneuverability. Um, and a good drag train, a uh, good drag train should be able to maneuver around terrain um, as well as get to like any slash all positions on the field with relative ease without being like severely affected by other robots and like game elements getting in the way. Um, so what drivetrain should you choose? Um, there are like a lot of drivetrain designs out there, um, but there's only two that are most commonly used. Um, and these are like the most versatile um, and they're really honestly a good pick for like any uh, game, but that's not to say you can't do other designs. Um, I would just recommend sticking with these two if you don't like have a specific like thing you want in your drivetrain. So, the first is Mechanum. Um, I know a lot of pa uh, other speakers have talked about it, um, and it's the most drivetrain, uh, most popular drivetrain choice by far uh, in the community. Um, and it's really loved because it has excellent mobility and agility because its Mechanum wheels uh, have like these rollers um, on the wheels. They're like their own like separate wheels, if you will. Um, and they're angled at 45 degrees, which allows it to strafe um, like left and right, in addition to also going forward and backwards. So a few pros of Mechanum, um, it has good acceleration, it has strafing capabilities, and it can be custom kit built. Uh, what I mean by custom is like your uh, manufacture your own parts and then kit built would just be like buying kit from like go build it and assembling it. Um, however, some cons is that uh, Mechanums can be pretty susceptible to defense, especially if it's a, a six wheel drive, which I'll get into next. Um, Good mechanic rollers can be quite costly. Um, a set of Go Build a, um, like rollers, I think, are $150. Um, they, they are by far the most popular choice, but again, they're uh, quite costly. Um, and lastly, the rollers can slip on terrain because, again, the rollers move independently of the wheel, so they roll around. Uh, so that can cause some slippage in there. Um, and the second thing I want to talk about is six wheel drive. So uh, six wheel drive, as the name implies, has six wheels and they're uh, usually all powered uh, from four motors uh, near the center of the robot. Um, it's commonly designed with omni wheels in the corners and uh, an attraction wheel in the center. Uh, and what I mean by omni wheels is that they're like these wheels with like omni rollers, uh, which make it easier for turning. And then the traction wheel, um, it gives you traction. Um, it's pretty favorable for terrain heavy games like this year um, due to its high traction. So some pros of six wheel drive, right? It has a uh, great acceleration like Mechanum. Um, it has really good defensive capability because it won't, um, since it doesn't have those um, individual rollers and since it has traction wheels, um, it will not slip on the terrain. So therefore um, it, it has a lot of pushing power. 
Um, these can also be custom or kit built. Uh, the two examples up here are custom, um, but there are kit built options such as um, such as uh, the go build a beeline chassis. Um, and then some cons though is that agility isn't great um, because you can't straight like Meccano. Um, and it can be slightly more complex to design since you have to incorporate that extra wheel in the center um, and figure out some other stuff. Um, so let's talk about, uh, so this is just like my opinion for which drivetrain to use for this year. Don't, please don't take this as fact. Uh, it's always better to do your own analysis of the game. Um, I'm not going to speak for all teams because every team has different circumstances in terms of budget um, and strategy. But in my opinion, like the best option for a drive train this year is going to be six wheel drive. Um, and if you haven't watched the game vid, um, there's like these pipes on the ground um, and six wheel drive makes it uh, really easy to clear that terrain. However, uh, with enough ground clearance, as in like um, the automotive plate relative to the ground, mechanics can get over the barriers as well. Um, so mechanism is still very much viable just make sure you account for that uh, ground clearance and cap. Um, so like I have this example over here. Um, um, so like a mechanical drive like this would get over the terrain really well, no problem. Um, this example is slightly overkill, but um, it's always better to be safe than sorry. So just design with that in mind. Um, so now we're going to get into like uh, CAD and like CAD for FTC. So starting just in general uh, about what CAD is and why it's useful. Um, I'm sure you probably already know a little bit about this from the other speakers, but I'll go through it like really quickly. So CAD stands for Computer Aided Design. Uh, and what it does is pretty self-explanatory. It uses computers to help you design things uh, and without really having to build it in real life. Uh, CAD is used in a lot of industries um, especially like engineering, um, and it offers a large number of advantages, such as first, visual, uh, visualization. Um, it makes it really, really easy to see three dimensions uh, without need for a paper and pencil. Like all your models, you can manipulate uh, to see all the angles, uh, which is something you really can't do with paper and pencil. Um, it's also really easy to tell when something is going to work and when something isn't. Uh, for example, if you have like two gears, you can easily tell if they're going to mesh uh, or not. Uh, the second is detail. Uh, CAD makes it really easy to measure things and make specific dimensions. And you can add like as little um, or as much detail as you'd like. So like you can go down to the inch, down to the millimeter, down to like point, like zero, zero of a millimeter. Um, and finally is that CAD is really industry standard. So in industrial applications, CAD is needed for designing almost anything. So learning it now is, uh, is it's pretty, uh, it's good if you plan on going into like an engineering career in the future. Um, so now uh, I'm gonna talk about a bit why it's good for FTC. Uh, so the first reason would be custom parts. Uh, so CAD is the best way to design uh, parts for custom manufacturing. Um, the two biggest parts of this are CNC milling like cutting plates out of aluminum or something, and then 3D printing, uh, which was covered like the like two uh, lessons ago. Um, and custom parts are a really big part in high-level FTC because it allows you to move away from specific patterns um, given by vendors. Um, because like, like Go Builda, even though an eight millimeter pattern is great and it's pretty versatile, um, there's still limitations, but with custom parts, you can really break free from those. Um, they also look really cool, in my opinion. Um, the second is cost. So CAD, um, when you CAD your robot, especially if you go into a lot of detail, you'll know exactly what parts and how many you need for your robot. So you don't need to go out and buy a bunch to like future-proof yourself or anything. Like you can still do that, but um, it really helps like reduce costs on stuff like you really don't need. Um, the third would be efficiency. Again, like I said, it makes visualization really easy and you can tell if like a design or mechanism will work or fail. And it helps avoid many of the oversights that result in free building. Um, because when you're free building something, like if you realize you, you're missing a part or missing a gear, especially if you're, if you're a rookie team that doesn't have access to a lot of parts, you realize, oh, I can't power this anymore because I'm missing like that specific gear. Or like 
if something doesn't really work the way you intended, you can't really do anything because um, like if you don't have that specific part, you're not going to be able to fix it, I guess. But in CAD, uh, you can tell if it's not going to work and just redesign. Um, and third, uh, or actually fourth, is versatility. Um, CAD allows you to create a better uh, and more robust mechanisms than free building ever will um, if you're good at CAD. Um, and it lets you become a lot more competitive uh, and it opens a door to a lot of different types of mechanisms because um, like vendor, like uh, mechanisms made by COTS parts or like just like, parts from vendors, um, you're very limited um, by the fact that like they don't, because they're just trying to create like the, um, like a solid design, but not necessarily like um, unique designs, if that makes sense. Um, and finally, I'm gonna talk a little bit about FTC CAD software. So there are three CAD software that are mainly used in FTC. Um, I think uh, first is Onshape. Uh, we use Onshape and in my opinion, I think it's uh, really well built for FTC and if not the best um, like CAD software for FTC. Um, it's really accessible um, It's because it's browser-based. You can use it on pretty much any computer um, and it's used heavily in the FTC community. And there's actually a team in North Carolina called Purple Gears that's created a parts library for Onshape and it contains like virtually all the parts you'll ever need for FTC, um, aside from like custom parts, obviously. Um, and that's really, really helpful. It really um, saves time um, with like the other software because you have to like actually download the step file and upload it to your CAD. But with like the parts library, you can just like insert, um, find your part and just click it and it'll insert it for you. Um, the other two options are Fusion 360 and SolidWorks. Um, starting with Fusion 360, it's a very powerful CAD software and it's advised that you use a higher spec computer for it. It's app-based and has really, really good support for rendering. Um, but like a kind of a drawback of Fusion is that it has like a pretty unique organization system. So it can teach you like certain bad habits. Um, and then the and then uh, the third one would be SolidWorks. So SolidWorks is very industry standard CAD software. Um, it has really intuitive direct modeling tools, but it's pretty resource intensive and it's not compatible with Mac. So if any of your team members own a Mac computer, you might want to consider that. Um, oh, that's it. Okay, so now we're going to get into like actually designing. So this is like um, my design workflow that I used for um, making our drive trains. Um, and this is like specifically for Mechanum. Um, I'm not going to go into depth on six wheel drive because um, it might be a little bit harder to understand, but this is, um, <clears throat> Mechano. Um, so there are like a lot of workflows you can follow, but um, I found that this one was really efficient for me and it probably will be for you too. So I'm gonna share. So step one um, would be to start on the inner plate and plan everything out like where wheels will go using holes. Uh, then work on the wheel assembly. And when you're done with that, attach it to the inner plate Third would be to make a motor mounting plate and use a belt calculator to ensure the proper C to C or center to center distance uh, from your belt to your motor, or sorry, from your wheels to your motor. Um, step four would be attaching motors to a motor plate and adding a motor pulley onto the motor with a sonic hub. Uh, step five, uh, add your belts. Uh, step six, this is optional, um, add a donkey pods on the inside plate. Um, Honestly, odontry isn't going to be huge this year um, because of the terrain. So you're going to have to come up with like a solution for, you know, like lifting it up or else it's going to get stuck when you try to uh, traverse the terrain. Uh, step seven uh, would be to make an outer plate, but don't pocket it yet. Um, just add the holes for the screws and standoffs. What I mean by pocketing is like taking out chunks of material and I'll get into that later. Uh, step eight would be to work on your other pop um, and if everything works out, then step nine is using crossbars to attach the two pods together. Um, step 10 is also optional. Uh, you add a dung tree to the back crossbar. Uh, and again, you'll need three dung tree pods, one on the left, one on the right, one on the back uh, to have like, a good localization. Um, step 17 would be to pocket your, okay, that's a huge one, sorry. Uh, I, don't, I don't think I fixed that, but step 11 would be to pocket your outer plate 
And step 18, this is also optional, but make a sick render and send it to me on Discord. I'd really love to see it. Um, okay, so um, I- Sorry yeah. to interrupt, but uh, you should start work wrapping up a little bit, going a little um, over time. Okay, so here's just a few uh, design clarification trends. So there's the inner plate, outer plate, motor mounting plate. Um, and then going clockwise, here's a belt, a motor pulley, wheel assembly, autopod, and like drive pods and crossbars. Um, and so real quick, um, I'm gonna go through like some stuff about how to make certain parts. So uh, first plates, uh, both your inner and outer plate will need mounting holes, uh, specifically on the inner plate. Um, you wanna do this thing called shower drain because it, uh, really allows for um, a lot of mounting points uh, on your robot um, and make sure all moving parts have clearance. Um, at least one millimeter is a good practice. Um, uh, the most common choice for plates are one eighth, uh, one eighth inch aluminum or 3.175 millimeters. And um, pocketing your outer plate is important. Uh, it'll save weight uh, while not uh, taking away the structural integrity of the alum uh, aluminum and it makes your direction look really clean. Um, and always fill up the corners of your plates as you can get called out at inspection for this. Um, then the wheel assembly. So um, most important step here is choosing between live and dead axle. In a live axle setup, the axle is attached to the wheel. And when the axle spins, so does the wheel. And in a dead axle setup, your axle is fixed and your wheel rotates around it. Uh, so you'll need both a wheel pulley and a wheel spacer um, to like fit the length of your pod. Um, I did 54 millimeters and then added two one millimeter shims on each side. Um, then the motor mounting plate, pretty self-explanatory. It's like a plate. Um, there's four, four to six standoffs that mount onto your inner plate. And then these holes that mount the motors. Um, and then so uh, I'm wrapping up here. So, uh, so here are just some design tips. Uh, there are good and bad ways to CAD. Um, so here's just some tips to make sure you CAD like, the good way. Um, always, always, always work in sub-assemblies when you can because this can speed up assembling things so much and it reduces lag. Um, use when vendor websites such as GoBuilder to check for measurements on parts. Don't just like blind guess at them because that's really inefficient. Um, plan out things before you CAD. Um, I really love like sketchbooks or notebooks because I can write weight faster with a pencil than drawing something or sketching something in CAD. Um, and use fillets. They take care of sharp corners and they most of the time make things look better. Um, and this is the last slide. So. Helpful resources. Um, CADing can be hard, um, and I know that. So please, please, please use any uh, like any slash all of these resources. Uh, you have my Discord. Uh, it's stims hashtag uh, 9489. There's also the big FTC Discord. I would really, really, really recommend writing this down and joining it. Like, please, I literally recommend every every like FTC person here to join this. It's super helpful. Like the people there are like just really great. Um, there's Game Manual Zero, which goes over a lot of essential concepts um, and mechanisms for FPC. Um, and this is our website, kind of a shameless plug. Like if you want to check us out, um, head over there. Um, and yeah, that's basically it. Um, so next we have outreach, um, creating and running robotic and STEM camps. Team Maximum Resistance will now be presenting in person in virtual STEM robotics camps. Maximum Resistance is also a rookie team in Alito, Texas. Hello, um, today we'll be presenting um, robotics and STEM in STEM camps, um, both virtual and in person. So STEM camps and just um, summer camps in general are really a great way to um, get your community involved and teach a, a larger audience about STEM. There are a variety of different ways these can be rolled out and implemented. 
And camps, um, when we think of summer camps and just um, robotics and STEM camps in general, we need to think of them more than just outreach as they're also an opportunity to meet new mentors that you can bring in to, to teach at these camps. They're a great way to um, fundraise as you could charge for these camps if they're in person or you're providing resources. They're um, a great way to look for future recruiting tools um, to find new members for your team. And they're just a generally um, uh, great way to teach um, young minds. So when you do hold a camp, you wanna to try to keep a main topic or area of focus uh, to keep people engaged and not like overdo yourself to, um, you know, going over too many things or making people confused about maybe what you're trying to talk about. So uh, try to focus on one thing. Like if you're gonna talk about robotics, um, maybe concentrate on notebook or design or just engineering in general. So just keep that in mind. Materials. Materials are gonna depend entirely on what you're hosting. Obviously, um, a robotics um, camps materials are gonna be completely different than something on ecology or biology. Try to get materials that can be used in multiple activities. Like certain examples of this could be like popsicle sticks. You could use them um, if you're doing physics camp or something, you could use them both to create like a catapult as well as a bridge. Therefore, you can save on costs and also have um, a variety of different materials for them to be used. Make sure to buy them um, and know how much you need ahead of time. Um, if you run out of materials uh, during the uh, camp, you can't always get more. You can't always get more, and that could end up being an issue. Um, and take cost into account. You, if it, um, if you can't necessarily afford. Um, all the materials you're going to need for the camp, you either want to um, scale back what you're going to be doing, or you may want to impose some sort of um, small fee for the people to attend the camp. So you'll also want to try to advertise as much as you can. Try to go through an organization. Uh, social media is a great tool, especially nowadays, since a lot of things are virtual, um, to get people interested in your camp. Um, when you do post something, try to be clear on registration, costs, and goals that you're trying to do throughout the camp. Um, promote in any way that will interest your demographic. So have a clear goal of who you want to be in your camp. You need to really consider your audience. Obviously, younger students aren't going to be um, uh, understand as much as older students. So you don't want to do any incredibly advanced topics with let's say like elementary kids. So what you want to accomplish and what your um, activities will be will greatly depend on that. Younger audiences also have a shorter attention span. So you may not want to do as much um, lectures or teaching um, with them as they can get bored really quickly. And you want to have a lot of hands-on physical activities compared to that with older audiences. Um, and that goes same for the um, timing and like scheduling of the camp. You don't want to have it go too long. Otherwise, they again, they may get bored. Um, you want to take their um, prior knowledge into account. You want if you don't think they may not, they may know a subject, you want to go ahead and teach that or pick something that wouldn't necessarily need it. So try to get as many other people involved as you can, because um, like we were saying, they can get bored depending on, um, you know, if you're just talking about one thing or if one person is just talking the entire time. Uh, so great people to bring in are mentors because they have a lot of knowledge um, and a variety of topics. So whenever you bring that in, they're always really interesting. Um, it's a great way to promote STEM jobs and meet professionals in the industry. So, you know, after graduation, maybe looking more into staying in engineering and robotics, um, trying to continue that line of the robotics community and what we're trying to do. Also schedule them ahead of time. If you're working with someone, let them know. So, you know, you can have a prepared camp and you're not um, trying to, you know, create anything while you're going. We'll first talk about in-person type events. 
So there are several pros and cons for um, in-person events. Um, you get a lot more um, interaction, which is a really great thing. You get um, you can get uh, the kids more infused that way. You can more directly help and assist them and encourage them. There's a wider range of possible projects. You aren't limited by what kids have in their house or what you can do over video. Um, there's a larger amount of physical resources. So you can't, um, in a remote, you can't necessarily send them all those resources or do something uh, with them, like especially like with robotics camps, you can't just give them a robot typically. Um, there is, of course, the con of having more resources needed. You're going to have to provide a certain amount of materials to um, each uh, child or attendee. Um, you're going to need a lot more physical volunteers, not just one or two people on a video chat. And you're going to actually need a place to set it up. Huh? Um, you, for places, you should typically look at um, uh, youth organizations such as your school or maybe your local 4-H or um, equivalent uh, organization, and they typically can give you a room to help step that up. So try to figure out your time limit before deciding on activities, because if you schedule an activity that takes a lot longer than the time you have, obviously you're not going to get as much done as you had planned. Um, take into account the time of year as well. Like you don't necessarily want to schedule a camp um, on Christmas Eve. Obviously, people aren't going to be wanting to go to that. Um, it's, you know, try to schedule a camp for when people will be around and looking for a camp, um, not during like school breaks, maybe um, spring break, Thanksgiving break, Christmas break, people are gone. So look into that as well. Activities. Use what you have to your advantage. If you already have a certain amount of materials, see how you can implement those into what in um, to activities that fit your theme. So therefore, you don't have to buy as much. Center them around a concept. So you don't um, want them to be all over the place. You want to focus in on, let's say, physics or math or whatever to keep um, them both engaged and more engaged and to have them learn more. Um, you want to encourage complex thinking and teamwork. If they're part of the team, typically they're a lot more enthused in what they're doing. And um, by having them question what they're doing, they can typically find better solutions or learn more. And lastly, be creative. There's a lot of great um, resources on the internet, but typically the best type of activities are the ones you create. So now we're going to talk more about remote and virtual camps. Um, so there's a lot of pros and cons that go with both in-person and virtual. Some pros of a virtual is it's more flexible in scheduling since there's less travel. Um, you can reach a larger audience. Obviously, you don't have to travel hours to go to a virtual camp, um, and it can be done regardless of any circumstances. Uh, cons, it limits projects, resources, and creativity. Obviously, when you have hands-on activities, people are going to be a lot more interested. You're usually going to learn more. Um, so keep that in mind when you're scheduling a virtual and try to keep people interested despite there being less hands-on activities. Um, like I said, it's more difficult to keep people interested. Um, you know, work with what you have. Be really creative when you're doing a virtual session. Uh, just keep that in mind. Know your limitations. Of course, um, with uh, with um, online um, screen sharing and uh, video chats, you're going to have a, um, a limit on bandwidth and media, especially if you're catering to rural, organization, uh, rural areas or whatever. Um, you're going to have lower video quality. You're not going to be able to share as much. So be prepared for that. Um, also be prepared, not just in material, which you're going to need to have lined up, but anything like any malfunctions with the system, you're going to have to have a backup plan for that. No one wants to be in the middle of a camp and have a Windows update, for example. Um, you need to cater to a wide range of hardware. For example, if you want to do a CAD camp, you have to take into my, um, you have to take into mind that some people aren't going to have a computer necessarily capable of running that CAD. So instead of maybe like Autodesk Inventor, you could look at doing Tinkercad, which is much more accessible and available to all forms of hardware. And lastly, keep it simple. If you overcomplicate something on an online platform, it's gonna be difficult to follow and you're not gonna be able to um, help as much as your um, distance from them physically.
So there's a couple of different ways to approach um, finding materials for remote camps. Um, oftentimes, if you wanna do something hands-on, um, try to find projects with things found at home. Um, people that people um, have in their home, like commonly, um, you know, toothpicks, pens, paper, stuff like that is gonna be found really common in a home. So don't, people aren't gonna be having like electric circuits at their home. So that might be more um, good for the kids um, because if kits you can send um, to people, um, but you really need to consider the price and how you're gonna distribute the kits um, because often there can be complications with doing that, especially if you're working with people you don't know. Again, keep it simple. Um, if you overdo yourself, it's just not gonna go as planned. Thank you, everyone. Um, do you guys have any questions? Um, if there's no questions, uh, next we have team 7172, Technical Difficulties, and they are a community team from Plano, Texas. They have advanced to FTC World Championship six times, and they were the division finalists in Robo Ruckus at the World Houston FTC Championships in 2019. Okay, so good afternoon, good evening, everybody. Thanks for sticking around till the till the end of the track, and uh, even a little bit late. I will try not to hold things too long. Uh, my name is Patrick Michaud. I'm the coach for Team Seventy One Seventy Two Technical Difficulties, and I'm formerly the PDP for North Texas FTC. So as where I'm titled now, the PDP Emeritus. And um, when I was talking with the workshop organizers, they said they'd like me to do a presentation. I said, what do you want me to talk about? We narrowed down topics and what we kind of came up with was um, what can we do to help teams with alliance selection? And we talked about possibly doing, how would you pick partners? But it's more likely for teams to actually wanna know how is it that we can be picked? In other words, what can you do as a team in your robot design and in your activities in order to be more likely that you will get picked? So let me um, pull up my screen here. Uh, this one, I hope this one, I think it's this one. Yes. Yes, there we go. Okay, so robot design for alliance selection. Uh, how do we get picked? What, are you, what can you do to make it more likely for you to be picked as uh, a as an alliance pick um, in the playoffs. Now, everybody would like to be a captain. It's always nice to be a captain, but a lot of things happen at FTC events and that doesn't always happen. And speaking for my team, 7172, uh, we've um, had a lot of success in First Tech Challenge over many, many years, but I can say that um, as often as not, we end up not being an alliance captain uh, because we're uh, often a first pick. We're a team that gets picked. So uh, that's kind of the, the approach that I'm taking for this. As I do this, feel free to ask questions in the chat and I'll be glad to go through those. So the first thing to note is what is an alliance captain looking for when they're trying to decide on which team to pick? And the two... a partner that can score well. But between these two, reliability is really the more important one. It is the thing that an alliance captain really wants to know that the partners, when they put them on the field, they're not going to have a robot failure. They're not going to have, you know, a, a, a bad match. They're going to be looking for, is, is this particular robot going to perform um, reliably? And reliability is more important than scoring even. So I would much rather as a captain have a reliable partner that I know is going to score me 200 points than a, uh, another partner that could get as many as 300 points, but in a bad match might get only 60. Because once you get to the playoffs, it's all about winning the match and scoring more than the other side. So reliability is far more important. 
So how do we um, get to reliability and what do I recommend for teams in terms of getting to reliability? So the first one is to constantly question the design. And I know that in our early team years, our team members were focused more on, can we even get this to work? And um, what I started doing with the team and what we learned to do is instead of saying, what, uh, what can we do to just make this work? Is to start asking ourselves, what are the ways in which it won't work, right? What are the situations in which this could fail? If we have a chain, is there any way that the chain can slip off? If it's a bearing, is there some way that the bearing can slip out of its socket? If we have um, a cord that is being used to lift an elevator, is there any way for that cord to get tangled up in things? And so think about all the ways in which things could go wrong and start defensively designing against those. Also for reliability, think about, um, look at the game and consider what penalties might come into play. What things might your robot do that would invoke, that would cause penalties in a match that would lower your score. Um, so you definitely want to avoid those. And then also for reliability, um, in designing a robot, don't consider only what can your robot do, but you kind of want to consider what could other alliances, opposing alliances possibly do to slow you down or to get in your way from achieving what you want to do. So what kind of defenses might you encounter? So those three things, constantly questioning the design, constantly putting yourself on the other side of what can go wrong to try and do it. And on 71, 72 and the teams I've mentored, we have a motto that if something fails on the robot, whether it's the robot or the drivers, then we fix the robot to try and make sure that can't happen again. So if the driver keeps making a mistake by hitting the wrong control or um, is having trouble getting something to work um, 80, 90% of the time, then we need to look at, at changing the robot so that the driver can't make that mistake anymore. And key to that is that we change the robot because it's really hard to change the drivers. Um, human behavior being what it is, anytime you can just redesign the robot or redesign the system so that it's impossible for the driver to make that mistake, you're in much better shape. Uh, our next part on reliability is don't compromise, right? Strive for excellence and, and robustness in your designs. So if you have a couple of competing designs, you know, go for the one that's more robust. If you're putting some parts together, don't just put together the minimal thing that looks like it's going to work. Look at it and say, again, how can it fail? Can you add a cover to it to make it more likely to, um, to, to withstand stress? Um, is it, you know, go for, um, if you have an axle on a bearing, put it on two bearings, make sure it's um, supported in more than one place. So look for robustness in designs, look for strong designs um, that uh, really uh, avoid the ways in which parts can fail. The other thing is uh, on 7172, at least, uh, throughout the season, we build for the long term and not for today. And for example, if there's a choice between um, implementing something today versus waiting a few days for a better implementation, say we need to get a part or something like that in order to be able to have a much better implementation or even a slightly better implementation, then we should wait. Don't think that you know I'm in a practice in the middle of October and like, well, I don't have the part I need, so I'll try and you know create something that is kind of what we want, but not exactly the best, uh, don't take those shortcuts, right? Go ahead, work on something else for a little while, but you're not trying to solve a robot in, in, uh, for tomorrow or for practices. You're trying to create a robot that can last a season. And so always think about the long-term things. And then another one, don't compromise with false economies. Um, uh, prioritize success over saving small amounts of money. Uh, at the beginning of this season, we had a rookie team member who came in and said we should not buy parts from a particular vendor because they were more expensive than what we can get somewhere else. And our answer to that is that's actually a false economy, right? If we save $2 on a part, but the design is not as good, we're not really saving anything. If you look at all the work that goes into a season, raising money, going to events, participating in events and um, you know, paying entrance fees uh, for event fees, things like that, then it's much, much better to, to go ahead and say, you know what, just prioritize the success and don't try and nickel your dime, dime yourself into, into a situation. Again, we have another quote for this. Um, and that is, if you don't have time to do it right the first time, you likely won't have time to do it over. <laughs> 
Uh, and so I'll often phrase that to the team where they'll be like, let's just do something today. And it's like, if it's not the right answer, right, when are you going to have time to redo it over? Make sure that you budget in that time to do it over if you're just putting something in place today. So reliability, try not to compromise. Then we get to scoring, right? I have a few more things on reliability, but I'm going to go ahead and go into scoring, right? And in scoring, our philosophy is to make our robots crazy, stupid, fast, as Mr. McCluskey from uh, Marcus High School likes to say it, right? Um, just make everything on the robot as fast as you can make it. Now, reliability comes first. It's much more important than, than speed. But when you have speed on your robot, it just opens up a lot of possibilities. And so um, we always start with the drivetrain, but go to other parts of the robot where get a fast, powerful drivetrain. And with a fast robot, a fast drivetrain, you can make up for a lot of other things that might happen in a game. If your robot can get to pl from place to place quickly, you can run around opponents, you can score quickly, you can do a lot of other things. And when you get to championship levels, what new teams to championship levels are often surprised by is just how fast the other robots are, either in scoring and how fast they move on the field and so forth. So just uh, um, prioritize speed for all of the different parts that you're doing when you're doing scoring. But again, only if you can also be reliable. Um, a partner uh, for this year's game, a partner that can process the carousel really quickly is it could be super valuable because top scoring teams are going to be focused on the warehouse and getting um, elements from the warehouse to the to the various shipping hubs. And um, so if they if they can find a partner that can reliably get the carousel um, ducks in the end game and get them onto the field and do other things to score, then partners are going to look favorably upon that. Um, alliance captains will look favorably on those partners uh, when they're trying to select teams for alliance selection. Um, the next thing I would say about scoring is to study the game scoring carefully. And I even made a special slide for this. Study the scoring carefully, right? A lot of teams will look at the scoring and they'll come up with some ideas about what really scores well. And then um, it turns out that they've actually missed a lot of the points in the game. And an example of that is um, from this last season, and we have that. But the points I would make is there are often more points to be had with some creative strategies rather than what just looks good on paper by reading the rules. And so you should not take the point values that, um, listed at face value. So last year in the ultimate goal challenge, uh, we early on in um, the season did our traditional um, brainstorming session where we have a full half day meeting where the team doesn't talk about robot designs. The team doesn't look at how are we going to solve this problem or what can we do for that? We look strictly at the scoring possibilities to figure out where all the points are going to be in a match. And we try to think about it at a championship level. What do we expect the top teams to be scoring, say, at the world championship? And um, what do we think the, the world record scores are going to be in the season? And so last year, where a lot of teams focused on autonomous and end game because the high, there were high scoring point tasks in those, what we realized is that all of the points for us was in teleop that our driver controlled period scoring, as you can see from our high scoring match of last season, um, was dominated by the things that we did in the teleoperated period and not by what could be done in autonomous or in the end game. And so you really want to study the strategy. You really want to study the scoring well. And I have an example I'm going to share from this year's game because I've seen a couple of um, presentations where people are talking about strategy. And I, I just want to give an example of how you can be surprised by looking at the scoring features. So this is this year's game and the point values for each one. And a lot of teams have focused in on the 20 point task in autonomous. So the 20 point task in autonomous is if you can score your preloaded um, box that is preloaded on your robot on the correct level with your team shipping element on the field. And if you can do that, you get a 20 point bonus. So let's look at the scoring of actually doing that. All right, so in autonomous, if you are able to score your preloaded box on the correct level, uh, when your team element, your, your team shipping element is on the field, you will receive six points for putting the freight on the hub. And you're going to get a 20 point bonus because you were able to correctly identify the correct level using your team shipping element. 
And then in, in teleop, you're going to get another two to six points for that box being on the hub. Two points if it was on level one, four points if it was on level two, six points if it was on level three. And so your total is going to be 28 to 32 points. Right. And so a lot of teams are saying you should absolutely have your team shipping element on the field so you can get that 20 point bonus. Uh, I'm going to suggest that the 20 point bonus is actually only a 10 point advantage and not a 20 point advantage. Because let's look at what happens if you did with the duck on the field instead of the, um, the team shipping element. So with the duck on the field and not your team shipping element, you would get six points for putting the freight onto the hub, and you'll get a 10 point bonus for putting it on the correct level. And as you can see, the difference in these two is actually only 10 points, it's not 20. So at the end of teleop, you would then end up with 10 points less. But if your robot's good enough, there's another option here because you could pick up that duck that is on the ground and put it on level three in autonomous. The duck is right in front of your robot. And so you could drive forward, pick up that duck off of the ground and stick it on level three, and you're gonna get six points in autonomous for a piece of freight being on the hub. Then when you add in the points for it being there at the end, at the end of teleop, you will have gotten eight to 12 more points because now you have two freight on the tub from autonomous. And so your total is going to be 30 to 34 points. You can see the score went up by two points by choosing a strategy that did not use your team element, but instead left the duck on the field, right? So uh, two points doesn't sound like a knot, but there it is, right? By looking at the strategy, there is actually a way to get more points in autonomous than by using um, the um, team scoring element as your marker. But we can do a little bit more than that. Let's say that your partner can't do the preloaded uh, the preloaded operation at all. They can't get the bonus at all. Have them put their duck on the field. If they put their duck on the field, then you can go through, score your preloaded box, pick up your duck, put it on level three, then go around, pick up their duck, put it on level three. That gets you six more points. And when you add the teleoperated bonus and so forth, you've now earned 42 to 46 points in autonomous by not putting the team shipping element on the field. Now, please be clear, I am absolutely not saying this is the optimal strategy. All I'm saying is, is that there are often hidden approaches to scoring more depending on um, what your robot is capable of doing and what your partner's robot is capable of doing, and you wanna be aware of those. Uh, if anybody has questions about how I came up with these numbers, I'm glad to talk about them later offline. You can send me email, things like that. All right. Um, the other thing I would say about scoring is always think in terms of an alliance scoring strategy, right? Um, can the robot start from other positions? Uh, if, you're, if your robot's designed and it can only start in one place to do autonomous, then you're not being very adaptable. Um, definitely consider putting an autonomous delay uh, routine in your robot where you can tell the robot to delay a certain bit before starting autonomous. Um, figure out what you think other uh, higher scoring robots might do and how can you help them? If you wanna be picked as a, as a team, then high score teams that are already going to be captains, if they're high scoring robots, then they're actually looking for people who can help them with their scoring as opposed to be high scoring themselves. Um, how can you get points out of a lower scoring partner? If you have a lower scoring partner um, or if something goes wrong with the captain robot, you know, what can you do to be able to still get points there? And then can you do defense while you are scoring? Um, in Rover Ruckus, our robot did extremely well at the world championships because that robot was designed to score well, both as a primary robot uh, going from the crater that was closest to us, but also as a secondary uh, robot where it would have to collect things from the crater far away. It was able to simultaneously play defense while doing a lot of active scoring. And then just to speak about defense, some teams will try and design robots that are very, very good at defense, but they don't necessarily do much else. And I will say that from uh, our perspective, those robots aren't really high candidates for us to be uh, chosen as alliance partners. The defense would have to be amazingly astounding in order for us to do that. Because you can often find robots that are able to do defensive things while they are able to score. So you want to make sure you preserve the ability to score and increase your score, even if you're interfering or um, otherwise interrupting what the opposing alliance is trying to do. 
Um, so we're, uh, uh, if we're presented with options and we have a robot that's reliable or a robot that can play defense really well, um, and both of them can do, you know, and the one that's reliable can score, we'll probably go for the scoring robot and not for the defensive one. Um, my final suggestions on things to do for uh, reliability and scoring and to try and make your robot better in matches is first of all, automate as much as you can. This has been one of our successes for many years is that we try to put as many tasks onto the robot itself to not make our drivers do it. So if we have an elevator, then we'll have presets that automatically get the elevator to go to the correct level and not require a driver to adjust it manually up or down. Um, if we're uh, loading blocks and having blocks move from place to place within the robot, we will manage all of that automatically, where once a block gets to a certain spot, then the, the mechanisms engage to get it to the next spot without the drivers having to do anything. Uh, doing this, robots can be uh, much faster than drivers in terms of getting things to work. The robots can be made more reliable and have greater precision, and it's less work for your drivers. And the less work the drivers have to do in operating the robot, the more they can look at match strategy and match dynamics to figure out where the best points are on the field. Uh, another suggestion is rapid iteration. Um, some teams will try and design a robot and they try to freeze the design. Um, but we have found in, in the top teams that we talk to that those teams are successful because they do rapid iteration. They're constantly evolving the robot and rapidly making changes and evolving over multiple designs to come up with the best design they can during the season. And it's, it's good if you can get a good base design to begin with and then rapidly evolve it. Um, doing radical changes in the middle of the season can often slow you down. Uh, there's times when it makes sense to do that, but in general, our experience has been that improving the robot you have gets you better results than starting off with something from scratch. And then finally, experience. Um, experience on the field accounts for a lot. Um, driver, driver practice a lot. And some teams, they plan that their drivers are going to spend 20% 20, 20 of the overall time that the robot is being worked on is going to be for driver practice, at least that. Um, and also get as much on-field experience as possible. Uh, nothing can take the place of actually being on a field with other robots and figuring out how you're going to drive around, how you're going to interact with those robots, if they're playing defense or not, um, to be able to score and be successful. So I highly recommend scrimmages. Uh, if you don't have a scrimmage, consider offering one. Try and get some teams together where you can just practice with other robots on the field because that is invaluable for knowing what's going to happen when you get to an actual event. So in summary, reliability right? Reliability being the most important thing to look for that we would look for in choosing a partner, but also you want to look at scoring strategy. And that scoring strategy is not only what your robot can do, but what you can do when partnered with an alliance and experience. Um, it's really easy to pick out the experienced drivers and the, and the experienced teams when you're at a tournament uh, by just seeing how they react to things that are happening on the field and they just, they just bubble to the top. So I think that's all I have for my presentation. So I will be happy to take questions if there are any. Uh, otherwise, uh, I believe I'm the last session in this track. I wanted to thank uh, 8565, Flyset, and all the other teams and presenters for an outstanding workshop today. It's been a lot of fun and I've really uh, enjoyed and learned a lot. Yep, thank you for coming and talking. Um, we have two more uh, giveaways. Um, the first is, um, the giveaway where it's just like our first giveaway. So Andrew, do you want to share your screen and show that? So um just checking if claire is still here oh yeah she's not here anymore yeah not here anymore either
Not here anymore. Oh, eight five six five oh two. Well, I don't think the eight five six five is here either. I'm a member of a uh, one 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 four seven two, and that was one of the things that was drawn. Oh. Um. Let me see what you want. You won a uh, $25, your team won a $25 Andy Mark store coupon. Um, I'm um, part of um, team uh, Maximum Resistance. Uh, did we win anything um, or no? Uh, let me see. Because, let's see the chat. First, um, they drew Elise. I don't know what FTC team she's in. And then... Uh, not, Win not ours. Winston, is he? No. And the other one was Lyndon. No, okay. Thank you. You're welcome. There was another one, but I'm pretty sure he already responded. Okay, so, oh, okay, okay. So uh, next is the uh, spinning for whoever asked the questions. Um, yeah, if, if there's like a mistake and you ask a question, just say it and then we can add your name. Okay, you can spin it now. Yeah, the, the drawing is only for those who, who ask questions in this meeting. And I'm checking if they're still here. They are. So um, I don't, I'm sorry, I don't know how to pronounce your name, but um, you won a $25 Amazon gift card. And uh, please, uh, private all the people who won stuff, please private mes message and uh, say your uh, team name, team number, and an email address that you want us to contact you and a contact phone number so we can give you what you want. Yeah, do, 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 do it to Andrew. So, uh, thank you for uh, coming and I hope y'all have a, a, a good rest of y'all's weekend. So, thanks so much. And if you want something, you can stay and you can like 
do your message stuff. Good job, Jessica. Thank you. Uh, same, same for Andrew, okay. I didn't know his story there. So once you've finished sending the uh, DM, you can uh, leave, I guess. Yeah, no problem. I really enjoyed it. Thank you guys for staying and um, hopefully we'll be able to do this next year.